Hello, I'm Graham and I hope everyone's having a great day and welcome to the fifth part of this new series I'm running for new users to the Panasonic Lumix FZ300 330 camera. Now in today's video we're going to be looking at the use of filters and close-up lenses with the camera. It's a question I get quite often on my photographic blog, the choice of filters, which type to use, which situations would you use the filters, and for close-up lenses, which would be my recommendations for the type of filter for uh, macro and close-up work. Let's begin by looking at probably one of the most controversial filters, and that's the UV filter. Now the UV filter has its origins back in the days of film. Film emotion has a high sensitivity to UV light and if you shoot in landscapes for example you may notice that the distant uh, hills would turn blue because of the amount of ultraviolet and the water vapour. So we used a UV filter which would eliminate that blue cast to the image. But with modern digital camera sensors the sensor itself has both infrared and ultraviolet absorption layers in front of it so there's absolutely no re reason to fit UV filters to the camera. Now this is where the controversy comes in. Some people say that it's a good idea to fit these to protect the front element of the lens and other people say no if you do that you're going to degrade the image quality and you lose low contrast and you're not actually going to protect the lens at all. Now I'm of the school that says only fit the filter in an adverse uh, situation such as if you're at the seaside and you've got the chance of salt spray uh, contacting the lens or you're perhaps at motorsports where there's a chance of flying debris coming in hitting the lens but in normal circumstances I would recommend that you don't fit the UV filter. If you are fitting the filter make sure the camera lens is scrupulously clean before you fit it and make sure you clean both the front and back surface of your filter otherwise when you're in the wide angle mode you might even see dust on the front surface of this lens when you're in that wide angle position especially if you're shooting towards the light the camera with its close focus ability will show you that dust on the film on the front of the uh, lens. The best form of protection is in fact the lens hood and the number of people I see carrying cameras around that don't use a lens hood is amazing. It's there to provide both the functionality of protecting the front surface of the lens and to shade the lens from stray light. So once the lens hood is installed you're not likely to impact the front face of the lens and in most cases it's going to shield the light from hitting the camera lens giving you ghosting and flaring and loss of contrast so always use your lens hood it's there for that purpose. If you are going to fit the UV filter of say clean front and back surfaces screw it onto the lens and then replace your lens hood. Now it's a not a good idea to stack filters so if you are going to use say the circular polarizing filter we're going to talk about next you must remove the UV filter before you fit the circular polarizing filter otherwise you're introducing too many glass to air elements and the risk of ghosting and flaring and loss of contrast is even more severe. So let's now look at the circular polarizing filter. Now the circular polarizing filter is there to reduce reflections in natural light. It doesn't work in artificial light so it's no use trying to use them indoors to take reflections off pictures and mirrors etc. It won't work but if you're in natural light outdoors it can reduce the reflection but there is a caveat to that as well. It only works when the light is between 90 degrees and say 45 degrees to the camera axis. If the sun is back over your shoulder and you're trying to photograph something, you won't see any reduction in the reflections at all. Here's a demonstration clip that I shot. The light is directly over my shoulder and I'm rotating this circular polarizing filter through 360 degrees and you notice there's no reduction in that reflection on the leaves. Turn to another situation where the light is now coming at 45 degrees or between 45 and 90 degrees to the camera and you can see that as I rotate the filter I can totally eliminate those reflections from the leaves or the water behind in that case. So you can see when the light is at 45 or 90 degrees to the camera I can totally re reduce those reflections from the leaves or if I was shooting water you can see that I can reduce most of those reflections from the water. So the circular polarizing filter screws into the front element of the lens and then you can rotate it while you're looking through the viewfinder to see when that cut point appears. Now it's probably impossible to fit the circular polarizing filter and your lens head simultaneously because you need to get your hands inside to adjust that front uh, rotating ring. So once that's in there, A you can't uh, install the lens head afterwards and if you install the lens head 
and then try and install the filter you see you can't get your fingers in there to adjust the front element so it is a situation where you're going to be using the camera without the lens head so again the chances of ghosting and flaring because of light striking those glass surfaces is very much increased don't be tempted to try the linear polarizing filter which again has its origins in the film days a linear polarizing filter may upset the way that the camera autofocuses so always choose the circular polarizing filter uh, for your uh, polarizing needs now let's look at another variant of the circular polarizing filter and it's the neutral density filter well, the neutral density filter comes in two varieties. One is the variable type, and this one is a variable ND filter. It's basically two polarizing filters. Uh, one is fixed and one rotates. And by overlapping the uh, cut angle of each of the filters, you can actually totally eliminate the light coming into the camera. Again, there's a problem with that. As you start to go to the maximum densities, you do see a color shift appearing, or in some severe cases, you'll see an X appear on the image where the two polarizing faces uh, cross over. So you can only use them from the minimum to about three quarters of the uh, ability to reduce light. But they're useful, especially in video, to get you the correct frame rate. But I'll talk about that when we do the video section of this tutorial. The other filters are the fixed neutral density and this one is the Hoyer Pro ND200 which is an 8 stop filter um, so that reduces the amount of light reaching the sensor by a factor of 8 f stops so it's ideal for shooting things like running water where you want to create those soft dreamy uh, flowing water scenes or if you're at a seaside and you want to create a very still looking sea long time exposures are created by using the neutral density filter if you wanted further light reduction you could use the Hoya Pro ND1000 and the Pro ND1000 is a 10 stop reduction in light so where the Pro ND200 is effectively 8 stops reduction the Pro ND1000 is 10 stops so it gives you an extra 2 stops of light reduction if you wanted to create super long time exposures so the reason for these is to extend your shutter time to give you those long time exposures with some of these filters there's also the possibility of a color balance change especially if you're using the darker filters so the nd8s you'll find that you get a color shift normally towards the green or some cases towards the magenta dependent on the die set that's been used with the filter so it's worth buying a good filter for both optical quality so you don't get any reduction in optical quality and b for the color balance stay neutral as you use the nd filter you can of course use a manual white balance to try and reduce that, um, it may help in some circumstances. Um, I've used a welding filter which is uh, about 10 stops and again by using a manual white balance I was able to get a neutral picture by using that manual white balance set up in the camera. Now a variation of the neutral density filter is the use of what are called graduated neutral density filters. Now to use those you need the adapter to go with your camera so that goes from the 52 millimeter thread to the 100 millimeter square filter holder. Most of this operation you can actually do in post-processing if you use the neutral density filter in something like Photoshop or Lightroom you can create the same effect but if you don't want to do any post-processing and you wanted to reduce the amount of burnout in skies for example you can use one of these neutral graduated filters so they're clear at the bottom and they've got then a variable gra uh, graduation from nothing up to uh, a fixed amount of density so you can slide this into the filter holder and with the filter holder on the camera you can look through the viewfinder and see at the point at which you're starting to cut off the, the amount of light in the sky. It's okay if you've got a level horizon but sometimes if you've got mountains and valleys you notice that the graduation darkens the mountains and it looks slightly artificial. So in those sort of situations it's better to create a mask in Photoshop and then reduce the sky without reducing the mountains. But these are useful if you wanted to stack things like neutral density and fixed density so you're making long time exposures and you're shading down the sky you can use two filters stacked together they're very close together so you don't get vignetting and with the 100 millimeters uh, frame you don't see any vignetting even at the wide angle setting so if you really want to improve your landscape photography you might want to consider using the 100 millimeter square filter holders in, instead of the circular ones 
Now let's look at close-up lenses. Some people refer to them as close-up filters because they're actually 52mm threaded and they screw onto the front of the camera, so hence the name uh, uh, close-up filter. With close-up lenses there are two notation systems. One is the diopter and you would probably get sets of number one, number two, number four. Some sets even include a number 10, which is quite a high magnification. And other systems use the D designation. So in fact, this one here is the Polaroid 250D, and that gives a four times magnification. So there is a number 500, which gives you two times magnification, but the 250D is the one I normally use, as that gives me a nice magnification ratio and a suitable working distance to my subject. Now there are two types of lenses, one is the single element lens and the other is called an achromatic lens. Now the achromatic lens is actually two lenses or three lenses bonded together to reduce some of the uh, defects that you get with a single element lens. With a single element lens you get distortion around the outside edges and sometimes you get what's called colour fringing or chromatic aberration where the lens can't focus the three colours of red, green, blue to the same focus point so you end up with uh, colour fringes. So it's best if you are going to get into close-up photography to choose what first of all an achromatic lens so this is a Sigma achromatic lens quite an old lens but still a very good sharp uh, close-up lenses. They're very difficult to find now so hence the reason for choosing the Polaroid 250D lens as a substitute for it. Again that's an achromatic lens 52 millimeters and it screws into the front of the camera and gives me that four times magnification. Another system is the Raynox system and the Raynox system comes with its own mount system. So the Raynox has a adapter which will fit most cameras from 52 millimeters up to 62 millimeters and it just simply clips into the lens thread of the camera and then you screw the particular lens that you want into their adapter. Now that is fine, it works well, but there is a possibility that you might just catch the tab and push it off and also if you don't get it on square you could end up with a part of your image being in focus and the other not. So I tend to not use the uh, supplied adapter but use step up rings from the 43 millimeters that the uh, lens has up to 52 millimeters so I've adapted from 43 up to 52 and then that screws onto the front of the camera like so and that keeps the lens nice and optically centered and it's parallel to the film plane so you don't get any shift in focus or optical shift in the axis I've just screwed the lens on. Again they're available in two strengths the 150 and the 250. If you're a new user to macro photography the 150 uh, is much easier to use than the 250 and it gives you a little bit more depth of field so if you are struggling to get depth of field in macro shots and you don't want to use stacking technologies to produce multiple images and stack them into one image then the 150 is a good starting lens gives you a nice working distance to your subject and gives you a reasonable amount of magnification now i'm going to put a link to a page on my blog where i've set out the magnifications and the amount of subject to camera distance that you expect to achieve when you're using these close-up lenses on that chart you'll see the various focus distances you can achieve when you've got the camera set to infinity and when you've got it set to its closest focus point you'll see the distances you've got the camera to the subject so dependent on the type of photography whether you're shooting insects or flowers you judge the amount of uh, magnification and the distance you need to be from those charts on that blog page so I hope you'll go and have a look at that and decide which lens to use in terms of optical quality there's not a lot of difference between the Raynox and the Polaroid system. Um, you do suffer from vignetting up to uh, times four with the Raynox lens. If you look through the back of the viewfinder when you first install it, you see there's a very dark circle and you've got to zoom out to about times four to enable you to move past that vignetting point. If you use the 250D, you can use the camera all the way from 24 millimeters all the way up to uh, 600 millimeters to get the required magnification without any vignetting from the lens itself. So hopefully that's given you some insight into the use of filters and close-up lenses with this camera. And have a look at the photographic blog. There's a lot more information on filters and close-up lenses there, and I'll put links to those in the video description below.
Now the next video is going to be on shooting video with the FZ300-330. be quite a long program, uh, there's a lot to talk about, recording sound with the video. Uh, it's likely to be about three weeks before I can get that ready because I'm into the middle of a very large DIY project at home and uh, it's going to take me about another two weeks to be able to complete that before the weather starts to get too bad here in the UK. So hopefully I'm going to get you that video within the next two to three weeks depending on the weather outside etc. So until the next one, thanks again for watching. If you're new viewer to the channel, please check out the previous uh, four other videos. Uh, there'll be a playlist in YouTube so you can actually look at the previous videos. So until the next video, thanks very much for watching. Please do take care and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye for now.